This is Life Rewired, the Brain Injury Podcast, for survivors, by survivors. And now your host, Rob and Ashley. Hi, and welcome back to Life Rewired. Today we have a special presentation brought to you by Craig Phillips. You've seen Craig on a prior program before, and today he's going to give us a presentation on finding purpose after a brain injury. So Craig, hello, and take it away. Hi, Rob. Thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to share this presentation. This is one of 28 presentations that I've created, and I've had the opportunity to share different presentations throughout the country since June of 2020. This is my 140th presentation that I've given through Zoom. So in the event that you would like me to give this presentation or another presentation to your group, please let me know, and I will get that scheduled. My email address is secondchancetolive1 at yahoo.com. That's like one, two, three, not O-N-E. So secondchancetolive1 at yahoo.com. So now we'll start the presentation, Finding Purpose at the Brain Injury Keynote Presentation. The reason why I'm going to go ahead and read this with you is uh, we all learn in different ways. Some people learn uh, visually, some kinesthetically some auditorily or a combination. So for the visual and auditory learners, I'm, I just go through the presentation. It also helps me to stay on track as I'm giving the presentation because I can get um, tangentized in my uh, my um, presentation. So so we'll start. This These are a couple of quotes that really have been a blessing to me or it just keep me pointed in the direction that I feel like God's leading me to go. First one, it, one that I wrote. It's not as important as what happened, happens or happens to happened or happens to us, as how we respond to what happened or happens to us. And a quote that I share often throughout my presentation, through my all of my presentations, is that everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. By Albert Einstein. And then a quote by Zig Ziglar, regardless of your lot in life, you can build something beautiful on it. And another quote by Albert Einstein, it is not that I'm so smart, it's just that I stay with problems longer. So, you know, that has been basically what I've learned in my life, which I'll explain as I go along, is that, you know, I tried to climb the tree of traditional employment for many years, and I was unsuccessful. And I also tried to do a lot of other things, but I was unsuccessful until I started my website on February 6, 2007, 17 years ago, which I'll talk about as we go along. So again, I want to thank you for being here and for the opportunity to share this message of hope with you. And you know, remember that it's very important that we don't give up on the process a loving God or ourselves. And I refer to a loving God because I realize that in my life, I need to have him help me, guide me, direct me, and protect me as I go about the process of doing what I feel like he's leading me to do. So I invite him into my life every day, and I ask him to guide, lead, and direct me. So many times I do not know what I'm going to do until I sit down on the computer, and then I get ideas. So here we go. What I've learned in my pursuit of purpose. Living with a brain injury can be likened to a, a box of jigsaw puzzle pieces that are dumped onto the table of life. Individually, the puzzle pieces make little sense. However, when put together, bring clarity. In this presentation, I will share what I discovered about these individual pieces. I will share what helped me to learn how to live and thrive with the conundrum of a brain injury jigsaw puzzle. So my journey, my process and journey in finding my purpose after brain injury. So the car accident at age 10 in 1967, I sustained an open skull fracture, right frontal lobe damage, a severe brain bruise with brain stem involvement. I remained in uh, traction or I remained in a coma for three weeks. I also had a fractured femur, which is the thigh bone, the largest bone in your um, body. So that was fractured as I came up over the back seat. My dad, who was driving 
before I hit the window windshield, the inside of the windshield. So I was in traction for six or seven weeks to set my left femur, placed in a full body cast, which I remained in for five or six months. And then I was transferred to another hospital where I went and, uh, underwent brain and skull surgery. I was transferred back to another hospital in New, New Jersey. I released, was released from that hospital a week or so later and was transported home. I was tutored at home in the fifth grade, taken out of the spike, uh, spike of cast, went through physical therapy for a couple sessions, and then I was on my own. I had several EEGs and that cognitive and psychosocial testing. The results were shared with my mom and dad but not with me. Back in 1967, there wasn't anything in the way of uh, neural rehab. So once my external wounds healed, I looked normal and I just went on with my life the best way that I knew how. However, I uh, bumped into a lot of walls and I felt like someone in a dark room trying to find a light switch. And I kept bumping into things that I did not know that were there as a result of the invisible nature of my disability and the deficits and limitations that I've found that I didn't have to be limited by and that I could move forward with my life as I'll share in this presentation. So my mom and dad did not share the results. Actually, my mom uh, shared them with me the day that I graduated uh, with my master's degree in rehabilitation counseling. As I said, once my external wounds healed, the impact of my traumatic brain injury went invisible. I was mainstream into elementary school in the sixth grade after being tutored at home in the fifth grade by my uh, fifth grade teacher who came to the house, gave me assignments, which I uh, did, and then I was mainstream back into the sixth grade. I was fortunate to graduate on time with my high school class in 1975. I started my uh, collegiate um, journey uh, at the University of Arizona in geology, and then I transferred into physical, edu physical education after I failed algebra three times and had a very difficult time with spatial orientation, such as mineralogy and other classes. That I just had a difficult time learning and understanding, so I transferred into physical education because I've been physical pretty much all my life. Um, been working at and doing different things along those lines, which I'll share as we go along in this presentation. So then I was transferred, I transferred to a community college from the University of Arizona to Pima Community College to take prerequisites. I applied to the licensed practical nursing program. And one of the requirements was to obtain my nursing assistant. Uh, like, uh, so I did that. And then I was accepted into the licensed uh, uh, nursing program, licensed practical nursing program. So I stayed in that program and I did well academically in classes and I did okay in the uh, practicums. However, when I got to a pediatric rotation, I had a difficult time uh, following instructions. I have a difficulty learning sequences of information because of my uh, the right frontal lobe damage and other damage that, to my brain that I really don't uh, understand, uh, but I've learned how to navigate around it. Uh, so about six, uh, eight weeks before I was set to graduate, I, I was asked to leave the program. So that was one of the uh, disappointments that I had along the way. Um, so then I transferred to Oral Roberts University and parents were asked to meet with the uh, chairman of the program that I was in. And so they traveled over from El Paso uh, to, Texas, to Tulsa and they met with my uh, the chair of the program. Uh, I don't know exactly what transpired in that meeting, but um, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't remember, but I continued on and I was able to get my, uh, uh, my undergraduate degree in 10 years with the University of Arizona, Arizona Pima Community College and then uh, Old Roberts University. And I got my degree in uh, theology with a minor in physical education and recreation. Uh, so then I uh, transferred uh, to Old Roberts 
where I got those, that degree. I then transferred, uh, applied for a uh, seminary at Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. I was accepted. However, I was placed on probation. And I, I believe that that was as a result of a recommendation letter that was sent by one of my professors at Oral Roberts University. So I was on uh, probation for the first year. And as a result, I had difficulties, uh, not because I was on probation, but because of my brain injury and other related issues. Um, and as a result, when I was going through a J term, which is between January and February, uh, the first year, I worked as a student chaplain at a, at a hospital. And as a result, I had some difficulties there because, uh, with the uh, chaplain as well as with nurses. Uh, and as a result, I, was, uh, I got a, a poor grade in that, uh, in that, uh, in that J term. So what I did is I continued on with my studies, and at the end of the year, well, one of the things that was I had to go through was counseling during that time. And as a result, I was um, asked at the end of the semester, told that they were going to meet at the end of August to determine whether they were going to let me to continue at ORU or at Asbury. Uh, so I went to my mom and dad's place in Tyler, Texas at the time, and I received a call which stated that I wouldn't be able to uh, continue with seminary until I underwent a year of uh, counseling, and then they would revisit it. So I was given three weeks to get back up to Wilmore, get my stuff out of the dorm, and then, uh, you know, close that chapter on my experience with or, or with Asbury. Um, I stayed. Um, can you mute yourself in the background um, because I'm hearing noises? Rob? Thank you. I applied to the, um, sorry. So after that occurred, I applied to the University of Kentucky. I had difficulties with the first practicum. And I met with the chair of the graduate program. And he went ahead and told me that he would give me one more chance to let me know if he would allow me to graduate. Uh, or if I, I'm sorry. After I went through the one practical, what happened was that I met together with the chairman of the program. And he said that he would give me one more chance to do another practicum. And if I didn't pass that, then he would have me leave the program. So I went through and I, I went ahead and I got, uh, I did well on the second practicum. I had a very kind uh, supervisor there. And after that, I continued on with my classes. However, due to having to go through an internship, which is a 40 hour a week um, a job, uh, <coughs> internship, I had difficulties in that also. And as a result, the chairman met with me and he told me that he he didn't know whether he would allow me to graduate from the program in rehabilitation counseling. And he would let me know an hour before the graduation. So I showed up uh, for the graduation. And as a result, I was able to, uh, I was told that I would be able to graduate with the class. And I called my mom and my mom, as a result, told me that you proved them wrong because you were able to get your undergraduate degree and your graduate degree. So you proved them wrong because the testing of 1968 showed that I probably never not be able to make it beyond high school academically. But yeah, sure, I had achieved what I did, but I ran into so many walls. And that was just one more step in the process of disappointments. So I was employed in, I moved to Florida. I actually, I worked in, in um, I worked in Kentucky for a year with a, uh, doing workers' comp rehab. And after I worked there, I got terminated. Uh, I looked for jobs and Kentucky did not find any jobs that were really uh, worth 
uh, to take a job with the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation there in Kentucky, I would have to go down from a $28,000 a year job down to a $13,000 a year job. So I decided to look elsewhere, and I, I moved to Florida. Um, I was fired from four professional jobs. I uh, applied two times for SSDI in Florida and then one time in North Carolina. I was a client of the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation in Florida while I was still working as a counselor on probation and then terminated as a counselor. I was later terminated as a client of uh, the uh, uh, Vocational Rehabilitation uh, at, because I had an unsuccessful job placement. So I'd been fired from that job, and I had also been terminated as a client. I then went ahead and I got a job with another agency. However, I was fired from that job, too. So I found out that North Carolina was rehab-friendly, so I sent up my, uh, my resume and a cover letter, and as a result, uh, was hired by one particular company to do workers' comp rehab. I moved to... North Carolina, and four months later, I was fired from that job, to like, to, telling me that my services were no longer uh, needed. So, so what happened was is that after I was uh, fired from that job, I tried to get other jobs, and then I reapplied for SSDI the third time uh, with the Department of North Carolina. And I also went to the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation here in North Carolina. And after the evaluation process, I was told that I was unemployable. So I, I've, like I said, mentioned earlier, I felt like someone all dressed up with nowhere to go because I kept their arm running into walls, both academically and, and jobs, but not professional and professional. So... I, but I still had a desire to use my gifts, talents, and abilities in ways that would work for me. So what I did is I wrote poems, an autobiography, and then a book. Uh, a friend of mine with some back pay that I received, I was able to get a computer. And as a result, I was able to start doing things on the computer. Um, I had a difficult time uh, with AOL. And with uh, the computer company, both of them didn't want to take responsibility. So I had to have my computer rebuilt two times piece by piece using dial-up and AOL. So I got another computer with another company. And on February 6th, after the encouragement of a friend of mine who said your information would be ripe for a blog, I started Second Chance to Live on February 6th, 2007. So through my six, 56 years of ongoing brain injury recovery, I discovered that I needed to involve my body, soul, spirit, mind, and emotions in the process. And that's what I really believe that it's important for us not to identify as a person with a brain injury, but that I, we are impacted by a brain injury, but we don't have to be stopped because of our brain injury. We can learn to how to use our gifts, talents, and abilities in ways that will work for us. And we can learn how to develop our mind, body, spirit, soul, spirit, and emotions as a result. So as a result, over the past 17 years, I've sought to share what has helped me through 460 video presentations. I've written 2,150 articles. I've also created 27, 28 keynote presentations and spoken a lot about neuroplasticity. And I've spoken 140 times since June 2020, as I mentioned earlier. And here, these are the various organizations, some of them that I've spoken to that I won't go through. So what helped me tremendously? When I reached a point in my life that I could no longer deny what was happening in my life as a result of my brain injury that I kept on running in wall, into walls, I was able to start confronting my denial through the process of the grief process. And during the process, I want to just share this, that I discovered that interest inventories and career assessments do not factor into brain injury. So I went through a lot of interest inventories and career assessments as well as um, 
two Myers-Briggs tests in graduate school. And none of them factored in how I was affected by my brain injury. So, so what I discovered, and this is a quote that I, excuse me, that I wrote, purpose is about a process and a journey, not a destination. I cannot know until I know, and knowing just takes what it takes. There are no silver bullets or magic potions. By accepting that reality, I'm given the gift of knowing. I'm given the gift of knowing by trusting the process, loving God, and myself. So it's very important to remember, because there are voices that want you and I to agree with their assessment of who we are as individuals living with, with brain injuries. We need to remember, you and I are not our brain injuries. You and I are not our diagnosis or prognosis about what's happened to us or what people are telling we can do or cannot do. You and I are not defined by labels, stereotypes, or societal stigmatization. Our brain injuries were only an event that occurred in our lives. Our brain injuries do not define who we are as individuals. We are not our deficits and limitations. What we can do to empower our lives, as I shared a little while ago, grieve the impact of our brain injuries. Grieve the impact of what we are no longer able to do and powerless to change. So for me, I needed to confront my denial. I needed to face my anger. I needed to work through the bargaining stage to try not to be affected by a brain injury, which I did for many years, as I shared earlier. I had to embrace my depression, and then I had to accept the reality. So what I found that through growing through the five stages that are uh, found in Elizabeth Kruber Ross's book on death and dying, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, I was able to get to a place of acceptance. And what acceptance helped me to do to get into action, to realize that I could do something different. And as, as a result, I had choices, and those choices would allow me to do things that I never dreamed possible a little at a time. And I like the illustration. I'm a visual person, and I like uh, different illustrations. One of those is the railroads. I believe life is like going down uh, the railroad track of life. And when we get to a certain point, we, uh, we come up against the brain injury, and I liken the brain injury to a switch on the railroad of life that points us off into a different direction that we normally would not go. And as a result, we get to learn how to use our gifts, talents, and abilities in ways that work for us. So the blue quotes uh, encourage me to not focus on my brain injury, but on possibilities. And a quote by Helen Keller, when one door of happiness closes and another door opens, but so Often we look at the closed door that we do not see the one which is open for us. And these are concepts that empower the process of finding and living our destiny. So what's really important, I think, is the, for each one of us to get tested because the way that we learn before our brain injury may be different than the, one that, the way that we learn now. And that's, I needed to get tested and I found out that I'm a visual and auditory and a kinesthetic. I learned through all, all three of those, but predominantly through hearing and then or through seeing and then through doing. And that's how I've been able to do a lot of things on, uh, on Second Chance to Live. I watched YouTube videos and followed patterns. And I had to repeat and go over and over and over again those presentations in order to get the patterns to be able to do what I've done. So my encouragement to you is to get tested to see how you learn. Because, you know, and I will share this, that I had a friend who tried to help me to learn about computers, and he was teaching me in ways that I did not learn. And as a result, he would become angry, I would be frustrated, and this went on for a long time until I realized that I was trying to get from him what he didn't have to give because he didn't know how to teach me. So I had to discover how, he, how I learned best. And then, and that's how I, how I figured that I learned through watching and then following patterns. So, and then another thing is like we talked about the jigsaw puzzle, it's that I believe our circumstances are not meant to keep us down, but they're meant to build us up because they teach us lessons that prepare us for opportunities that 
give us the opportunity to learn more lessons and to, to be given more dis, uh, more opportunities. And I believe that life is like a tapestry. Uh, there's many cords, uh, colored cords on one side of the uh, t uh, canvas that seem to make no sense. You know, all our disappointments, discouragement, all the uh, heartache that we've had through the way, they've all been part of the process for me, which I've discovered. So my encouragement to you is to not give up and not get just don't give up and realize that everything is working together for you good. I've come to learn that my circumstances are not being done to me, but they're doing, being done for me because they pointed me in the direction of my destiny and they continue to do that a little at a time. So as we learn from each lesson that we are given our opportunity, disappointment, discouragement or other things that may occur as a result of our circumstances, I believe that one puzzle piece falls into place. And as the puzzle piece falls into place, another puzzle piece appears, another lesson. And as a result, we get to learn about that lesson, and then we're able to step on the next puzzle piece. And slowly but surely, all the puzzle pieces fall into and connect into place. When I, I've been studying Mark training in different martial art disciplines for the last uh, 26, 27 years. My sensei, Seagong's original instructor was Bruce Lee, and his philosophy at Jeet Kune Do is to research your own experience, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, and add specifically your own creation. So what I've done in my life is that that's what I've done. I've kind of, I've learned what works, what doesn't work, and then I've got rid of what doesn't work and I've learned how to create in ways that work for me. When I first started a training at the martial arts school when I did back in 2000, I trained in martial arts before then, but in 2000, I had a conversation with my sensei and he shared with me an illustration. He said, what I do is I give you ingredients. Well, your job is to combine those ingredients and bake a cake and bake your cake of becoming a better martial artist and on your way to your black belt. So that's what I've done in my life. I've learned that I've had to gather a lot of ingredients in order to bake my cake. And you may find that you also need to gather a lot of ingredients to bake your cake and to become who you're supposed to have created to become to be able to fulfill your purpose. And I like the illustration of the elephant. How do you eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time. Thomas Edison was the inventor of many things. One of those things was the light bulb. He had a newspaper reporter come up to him and say, Thomas, you failed so many times. And Thomas said, no, I've not failed. I just found 10,000 ways that won't work. So it's just in the way that we change the way that we look at things. We don't look at them as failures. We look at them as opportunities to teach us what doesn't work so we can find out what works. And then this by Babe Ruth, he was the home run king of his day. He was also the strikeout king of his day. He also had a newspaper reporter come to him and say, Babe, you strike out so many times. And yet Babe said, yes, but every strike brings me closer to the next home run. So again, the illustration is that we don't give up, that we keep on swinging. We keep on stepping up to the plate and we don't give up. And as I talked about, circumstances or lessons, opportunities, which give us more lessons and more opportunities. I like the fable, the uh, fable of the tortoise and the hare. The tortoise challenges the hare to a race. The hare laughs and scoffs at the tortoise, but the animals of the forest, they set up a course and the tortoise and the hare starts off on the race. Well, the Hare runs into a field, he plays for a while, lays down for a nap, and then rushes to the finish line where he finds the, a tortoise. And at the end of that fable, the saying is, slow and steady wins the race. So it's really important that we don't give up on our process of loving God or ourselves because more is going to be revealed. That we need to keep on going forward, that we not give up. Because... We will win if we don't give up, like that um, line says, slow and steady wins the race. And then the story of the crack pot. This story illustrates the value that we may not see about us. What it is, what happens is the story 
uh, is that there's a water bearer. The water bearer has a, a pole that he puts across his shoulders. And then he puts one pot on one side and another pot on the other side. And he goes down to the river to get water for his master's house. And as a result, he brings that back up the hill to his master's house. And this goes on for two years. And the, the one pot has a crack in it. So it leaks out all of its water and as not half, half of its water. And as a result, he had the crackpot had a conversation with the water bearer. He said, water bearer, I'm so embarrassed. I don't give it a full load of your process of getting water. And the water bearer said to him kindly, he said, do you not notice the beautiful flowers that are on your side of the path? I knew about your flaws. And as a result, I planted these one, these uh, seeds so that they would grow up as you water them through the cracks in your pot. And as a result, I'm able to grace my father's, my uh, master's house with these beautiful flowers. So my encouragement to you is I need to remember, although we may have cracks that we may not realize that are being used to help other people, don't give up because they're creating beautiful flowers and other things in people's lives to give them hope. And here's a couple quotes that I like. If you advance confidently in the direction of your dreams, and endeavor to live the life that you imagine you will meet with a success unexpected in common hours by Henry David Thoreau. And then Abraham Lincoln, you might know, he had many, many, many disappointments in his life on his way to getting the presidency. And his quote is, I will prepare and someday my chance will come. And then a quote by Prometheus, big things have small beginnings. And a quote by Alice Walker, the most common way people give away their power is by believing or thinking they do not have any. So fit, through 56, excuse me, through 56 years of ongoing brain injury recover, as I stated before, I needed to involve my mind, body, spirit, soul, and emotions in the process. There's a typo. So I did articles, video presentations, slideshow presentation, and ebooks. I have twelve ebooks, which I'm in the process of getting them uploaded to uh, to uh, Amazon. So in the future, I will be offering those books for sale. So I needed to empower the whole person, not the brain injury. So using the principle of neuroplasticity, and I also have another presentation on neuroplasticity, setting goals, and creating hope after brain injury that is available to be looked at on my website. So neuroplasticity, I believe is it's what it is is creating new neural pathways and brain reorganization through repetitive mirror movements, through incorporating both sides of our body. And I believe that as we do that through the corpus callosum, which is a bundle of nerve cells between the right and left hemisphere, it connects our body the right side of our body to the left side of our body. So as we do repetitive, as we cross the center line, we're able to uh, create new neural pathways. And I, as I said, I've been training in different martial arts for many years, 26, 27 years. And I have a couple of demonstrations that I would like to show you, just to encourage you to go ahead and start your own program. And the things that I'm able to do in these these uh, videos, that short videos that I'm going to show you, are just it just takes time. So just don't give up. It, I had to learn one skill and repeat that skill a bazillion times, and then learn another skill and repeat that a bazillion times, and then combine those skills into a skill set. And then I had to replicate that process over and over and over again. So this I'll show the first presentation. Your Filipino stick fighting uh, it creates, uh, helps me to work on gross motor skills and mu large muscle groups. And I use smaller sticks because this allows me to use more fine motor skills and more uh, smaller muscle groups. And then I use even shorter sticks to reduce the um, work on more fine motor skills. And then after, I, and it helps me to work on agility, focus, precision, hand-eye coordination. Uh, and then I use uh, these putty knives to work as knife strikes, which are involved with um, uh, Jeet Kune Do. 
So I do horizontal, and I'm working on different uh, different strikes. Then I use uh, vertical strikes, so it's working different parts of my brain. And then after I do this, I, I train in uh, different martial arts, and part of those martial arts is Western boxing and Muay Thai kickboxing. Muay Thai is my primary martial art. So this is a jab, cross, uppercut, hook. And I did this in June, uh, in uh, September of 2021. And I continued to train. I did this on the top of the roof at the Y where I work at here in Charlotte. These are center line strikes, Wing Chun center line strikes. And then, um, and then um, I have to go back down to, are you still there? Jeez. I guess we're still here. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. I uh, clicked something, think I was getting back, and it. Okay, so we're back to the. Sorry. I'm learning this new um, with uh, right side broadcasting. It's different than what I normally uh, use. I use um, Zoom. Uh, so it's a there's a learning curve to this, so it's nobody's fault. It's just that I'm learning this process. So this is the second presentation. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just skip on to this. Oh no, I'll do this. This um, yeah, I'll skip on to this. What I'm doing is is that, and this was done on March 16th, uh, about two or three weeks ago, or a month ago. So what I'm doing is I'm just continuing to train both sides of my body through um, to the different martial arts that I do, the Western boxing, the Wing Chun, the Muay Thai elbows. Then I go ahead and I work on uh, the smaller sticks. Again, I'm working on the different, um, different uh, fine motor skills, movements to uh, crossing the center line. And then I also do that with um, the putty knives again. I do horizontal strikes. Okay. Then I do vertical strikes. So what I do is I just share this to show you that I continue to do what I'm suggesting that you do. It's because it, it's going to be able to help us to accomplish things that we never dreamed possible. I think it's great. So now great. Go on. Thanks for your patience as I'm learning this. Um, so what I have is at the end of the presentation, I have um, I have a link. And what you can do is you can click on this link, and it'll bring you to this page. And in this page, it'll just I'll explain more about neuroplasticity. And then what I have, I, a friend started helping me, uh, you know, video tape these presentations back in 2013. My friend helped me uh, to do this because I was giving a keynote presentation at the Southwest Conference on Disability, which I included this this particular uh, presentation. And that was the first uh, pre uh, presentation or demonstration. So I have different presentations that you can look at if you'd like, and it'll just show you. So I got that. And then what I also do, I really want to uh, point your attention to this at the end, is that I have 
<clears throat> I have a lot of resources. If you come to my uh, come to my website, you'll see that I have this resource, and I I have the ability to translate Second Chance to Live into a lot of different languages. So if you have friends that speak a different language or read in a different language, they can convert Second Chance to Live into their um, into their particular language. Then I have a video, uh, as I shared earlier, I have uh, categories that I, I speak to. There's just different, different other resources that you can look at if you'd like. So this is the end of the presentation. And now we can open up for comments or discussion, uh, at least uh, if you have any, uh, Rob, thoughts. Thanks for muting earlier. Oh, no problem. No, that was an awesome presentation. I uh, enjoyed the videos that you shared with us. Those were nice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I just want to thank you for the uh, the opportunity to be able to do this. It was an honor. And yeah. um, do you have any questions based on what I shared or? No, but I would like to encourage our audience that watches this, if you have any questions or comments, to please put those in the description below. And then um, if Craig sees them, he'll answer them. If not, I'll be sure to forward your questions on to Craig, and um, he'll get he'll definitely get you the answers for those. Uh, also, visit his, his website, and um, if you have other questions, you can email him directly at Second Chance to Live One. At yeah. Yahoo? Yeah, second chance limb one at yahoo.com. You yeah. can email me then. Yeah. So thank you so much, Craig, for doing this today. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, sir, for the opportunity. I know we went over a lot of information. Please do share, if you can, with this, uh, share a link to the presentation so that people can actually go over the presentation because I know I went over a lot of material in a very short period of time. Yeah. Then they can review it. So. Yeah. Great. Thank you once again, Craig. And if you guys have any questions, be sure to hit Craig up at his email address or hit on the comments below. Until next time, this is Life Rewired. Thank you. Rob. Have a great day, everybody. Godspeed and God bless.